Hey guys, welcome back. We are doing our Unit 3 Classes of Matter second lesson where we're going to look at different types of mixtures. So don't forget you have homework. Go ahead and finish your Classes of Matter homework. That'll be due on Wednesday. Make sure you're hitting up Schoology to get all of those things turned in. Now let's take a look at today's lesson. Today's question of the day is to see if you can classify each of these items. You have a chart in your Schoology um, online OneNote, or you can use your actual packet. Let's see if we can classify some common items. Your page looks something like this. But I'm going to do it here so it's a little visually more impressive. Remember what elements are. Elements are pure materials made of one type of atom. Compounds are chemical combinations of those elements that make a new material. And mixtures are just combinations of those things. So let's look for anything that could be an element, such as you might find on the periodic table, the most pure, simple things we can find. Carbon is a simple, pure material made of only carbon atoms. The oxygen in this tank is also a pure material, just made of oxygen atoms. Gold, in its most pure form, would be the 24 karat gold variety, like in this gold bar, and that is an element. Let's look for some compounds. One clue to look for is chemical formulas. Chemical formulas tell you that it's the same everywhere and always, such as in carbon dioxide, it's always CO2, and water is always H2O. They're always pure. But if you start mixing things like water with salt, you could get ocean water, or sugar with flavoring, you can get candy. So your mixtures, elements, and compounds would look something like this in your packet. Today's objective is to tell the difference between elements, compounds, and mixtures as we continue on focusing specifically on mixtures. So if you haven't got your packet, go ahead and grab that. Let's continue and find out more about mixtures. Mixtures, as we know, are physically combined materials and therefore can be physically separated. The type of mixture you're looking at will determine the way you separate it. Let's take a look at a simple example. It looks like they have a can, kind of a mixture of different colored beads and some salt. A clever way to separate this mixture is to put the whole thing into water. What happens? Well, it seems like the yellow beads are more dense than water and sink to the bottom, and the blue beads seem to float. We've separated most of the beads. What happened to the salt? That's right, the salt dissolves in the water. So to continue, we could scoop out the beads, filter out the water, and we've got the salt and the different colored beads completely separated. Knowing the properties of the material really helps you when you're trying to separate them. That's why we did properties last unit, so you could get some clues about how to do some separation techniques. Now, let's look at deeper into mixtures. There's so many different kinds of mixtures, and we can classify them into two main groups. Let's start with the homogenous. A homogenous group or mixture is a physical combination of materials so evenly mixed that you can't see the parts. Many mixtures are homogenous. Smoothly mixed pudding is a great example. You can't see the sugar, chocolate, milk, or other ingredients because they're so carefully blended. Other examples, salt water. Salt and water dissolving, evenly blended from top to bottom, it's completely the same. Air homogeneously mixes so that you can't see the different parts. For the most part, the air is simply a clear gas. Ketchup and something we call homogenized milk, which means that at the factory, it's blended so well that the parts don't separate. What about a mixture where you can see the parts or that does seem to have different pieces? Those are called heterogeneous. Heterogeneous mixtures are physical mixtures that are not evenly mixed. They're not blended as well. You can actually see the parts. In our picture, we have rice and different ingredients for soup, but we can see all the different parts. They may not be as evenly blended. Pens and pencils 
different kinds of coins, sand and salt. Salad. These are things that are a little harder to blend. They have larger pieces, and if you can see the pieces, they're probably heterogeneously mixed. Feel free to pause if you need to, but we're going to take a look at a quick example. Classified by how well mixed they are. As you can see, this salad does not appear to be the same throughout. Heterogeneous mixtures are substances in which the components are not evenly distributed. Vinegar and oil, seen here in two separate layers, is used as a salad dressing. It is a poorly mixed heterogeneous mixture, and that is why it needs to be shaken before pouring. This cereal is another heterogeneous mixture. It is made up of oats, seeds, coconut, and raisins. Each component, when added to the mixture, retains its individual properties and is not chemically combined. Homogeneous mixtures, like this paint, are different from heterogeneous mixtures in that they are well mixed and the same throughout. This milk is a homogeneous mixture in that it is chemically the same throughout. Other examples of homogeneous mixtures include toothpaste. Perfume is also a homogeneous mixture. That's a great video that really shows how science holds up well over time. Well, what if we want to separate mixtures? One of the best ways to separate mixtures is simple filtration. Filtration is a great way to separate mixtures based on the size of the particles. So, if the size of the materials in your mixture are different sizes, you can use filters to separate them out. For example, a coffee filter. It's basically a piece of paper where the fibers are interwoven. But if you look closely, there are small holes that allow the liquids and flavors to pass through while catching the grounds in larger pieces. This is what we mean by filtering. Separating macaroni from water through a strainer is another example. Sometimes filters are so good that the openings are microscopic. This helps filter out bacteria from water. But most filters, especially those made of simple materials like paper, are not capable of separating dissolved materials. Salt, for example, when dissolved in water, is simply too small and a too similar size of water molecules to be separated from the water. So filtering out salt just doesn't work. Distillation is another method of separating materials. Distillation works well if you want to dissolve, separate dissolved materials. Distillation uses the properties of the material that you are trying to separate. For example, the property of water is that it will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. Something like salt, for example, does not boil at 100 degrees Celsius. It remains a solid, and it will remain left behind after the water has all boiled and turned to a gas. This is a really good way to quickly separate salt from water. Distillation uses one more step in which it catches the vapor, recondenses it back into a liquid, and collects the remaining liquid. In this case, we've now separated the salt from the liquid, and we have both of the original materials that we started with. Here's what happens. In this flask here, I have water. The red dots represent salt. Adding heat will add energy. Water molecules will turn to a gas at their boiling point. They'll travel up the tube, pass by the thermometer, and then turn down this opening. This part of the tube is much cooler than the water over here, and sometimes we actually run some refrigerant or coolant to help cool this down. But condensation will happen. Condensation is when the gas turns back into a liquid and starts to drip. Over here we'll collect all the new fresh distilled water which has nothing but water and in this container the salt particles will be left behind. Let's take another look at this using a model that can help explain distillation just a little bit better. Why can you use the process of distillation to take a mixture and separate it out into its parts? So for example if I have a glass of water and say I add salt to it and stir it around and dissolve the salt. 
I can pour that mixture into a distillation flask, a new distillation, and then I'll get out at the end the water that I started with and the salt, and they'll be separate. So as you can see, we've got a model here of some molecules in, in our distillation flask, a container, and a place to catch the condensed materials. Let's take a look at what that would look like. The thing is, I don't just have to use distillation to separate a liquid from a solid. I can also use distillation to separate a mixture of liquids. Here's what I mean when I say a mixture of liquids. Let's talk about three liquids right now. These are going to be water, methanol, and ether. You might not be familiar with any of these liquids besides water, but they're all just clear liquids that look a lot like water. So if I took a, three bottles of each of these and I poured them together and mixed around, I'd get something that is just a clear liquid. All of these are mixed together. Okay? How can I separate this out? I can use distillation to pull each of these liquids out separately and to break the mixture up into its parts. So, Here's what I'll do. Let's pretend that we can zoom in on this mixture of liquids zillions and zillions of times and take a look at what its molecules would look like. This liquid mixture is right in here in my flask. And you can see that there are three different kinds of molecules. There's water, which is this. There are also molecules of methanol, which look like this. And then there are some molecules of ether, which look like this. So again, I want to be able to separate out these three, type, these three types of molecules. So the way I'm going to do this is by using their boiling points. As you can see, ether has a relatively low boiling point. Methanol has kind of a medium boiling point. Relatively speaking, water has a pretty high boiling point. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this flask, and underneath it I'm going to put a Bunsen burner or a hot plate, something to heat this liquid mixture up. Ether has a low boiling point, which means that at a very low temperature, maybe just around the time that this flask kind of starts to get warm, the ether is going to make the transition from liquid to gas. It's going to start boiling. So let's imagine this happens. These ether molecules are going to come out of the liquid phase. They're going to be gas, and so they're going to move up here into the top of the flask. As gas, they're going to enter this condenser. This condenser is cool, remember. And as they move down the condenser, they're going to get colder and colder until the gas ether turns back into liquid ether. And then this liquid ether is going to drip down into a beaker or glass that I have waiting right here. Okay? So that's how I'm going to get the ether. At a low temperature, it starts to boil. This is something that's important to keep in mind. The other stuff, which has a boiling point that's higher, the water and the methanol, it will not boil when the ether boils, because it has to be hotter for these two things to boil. So that means at this low temperature, only the ether is going to be turning from liquid to gas. The water and methanol, they're going to stay in the liquid phase. So here's what's eventually going to happen at this low temperature. Okay. So now all of my ether boiled out of the flask, condensed in the condenser, and dripped into this beaker here. So now I have a beaker that's full of liquid ether and none of this other stuff. Okay, so I got the ether out. The next thing that I want to do is get the methanol out. I'll do this by raising the temperature of the flask. And I should point out that this thing up here represents a thermometer, which we often put at the top of a distillation flask. That's just to keep an eye on the temperature so that we know when to expect each of these chemicals to be coming out and into our collection beaker here. Okay, so anyway. We raise the temperature a little bit more, and we'll reach the temperature at which methanol boils. So then these methanol molecules are going to pull out of the liquid, and they're going to become a gas and go into the condenser, go down here, and go into the beaker. And again, I should point out that while methanol can boil at this medium temperature, the water isn't going to be boiling. So the water is going to stay liquid even while the methanol is able to come out and form a gas. Okay, so now I have a glass of liquid methanol. I've separated that from the water. So you have seen the separation. We've got rid of the ether, the methanol, and here's the water left over here. And sure, you could boil that away and collect it as well, just to make sure. And any impurities or anything else that was maybe dissolved there would be left behind. So those are simple techniques to remove materials uh, when they're mixed. All right, and I've got a third method here, chromatography. It's not in your notes as far as writing it down, but it's a really good separation method to, to know about. Uh, chromatography basically uses um, filter paper, but in a different way. What we're going to do is allow materials to be pulled or drawn up through a paper. And as you remember, the crisscross fibers in this paper have different size holes. So in this case, we're just using ink from a pen. And then as water passes through, 
Through the ink, it's drawn up into the filter paper, and let's see what happens. We're separating the different colors. So basically what happens is particles that are a little bit larger get caught quicker, and the smaller particles are allowed to pass through. So this ink was actually made of three different colors of inks blended together, and we can use chromatography to separate them. And since they're now on paper, you could actually cut them out and say that you've actually separated the blue from the yellow from the red inks, and we could do this not just with inks, but of different materials that are mixed up in a mixture. Chromatography is just another way to separate materials. I'll show you a quick little clip of what that will look like. In this video, we're doing some chromatography. Chromatography comes from two Greek words meaning color and writing, and you'll see why. First, we'll draw a line on a strip of filter paper with a marker. Then, we'll suspend the paper strip in a beaker with the water level just below the line. As the water travels up the paper, it takes some of the ink with it. The ink is actually a mixture of several different colors. The colors travel up the paper at different rates, so they spread apart so you can see them all. This works with many different colors of markers. Chromatography is a technique for separating the individual components of a mixture. You can try it with different colored markers, with food coloring, with candy dye, and more. You can also try it with permanent markers if you use rubbing alcohol or nail polish remover instead of water. Hey guys, so that is our unit uh, three, separating mixtures. We talked a lot about different kinds of mixtures. We talked about homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures and some ideas about how to separate them, which could come in handy. You never know. Here's one using a sieve or a filter are great ways to separate by size. Letting something evaporate will help you with dissolved materials, although when your liquid evaporates, it's gone into the air, and all you've got left is the dissolved particles. So you're going to need distillation if you want to collect both of the parts. Chromatography we also explain um, in the last segment. So think about different ways to separate mixtures, and think about different ways that separating mixtures could give you the parts you started with. All right, guys, so last thing I want to um, tell you about is a project. You'll find it in the back of your packet. It's called the Survival Project or Survivor Project. And basically what I want you to do is think about all of the things we've learned about mixtures and how to separate them. And you're going to make a little project wherein you attempt to survive. You have lots of different options about how to present your project videos, real-life versions, cartoons, directions, a diary. But basically the gist of what you need to do is figure out a way that you would survive if stranded on a desert island. Now there's plenty of information in your challenger right in your packet. I don't want to give you too many hints here, but you do have a bunch of materials with you on your island and you also have your knowledge which could actually save your life. The real goal is to separate water from the salt that you find in the ocean to make that water drinkable. Think of a method that you could use to actually help you survive. So um, that's a project you can do over break and start um, thinking about at least getting some ideas and rough draft. That's definitely on the horizon here. It'll be something that we collect after break at some point and we'll definitely let you know more about that. We'll put some resources here in Schoology, but I just want to give you the, the intro to that. Hopefully everything um, it's clear and you're understanding that. And I really hope that you enjoy the Survivor Project. And thanks so much for joining us and thanks for trying science. See ya.